Welcome to the Loving Truth Podcast, where it's all about finding clarity, confidence, and peace in the face of marriage challenges. And now your host, relationship expert and certified master life coach, Sharon Pope. Hello, loves. This is Sharon Pope, and this is The Loving Truth. I have a real treat for you today because I have invited a good friend and a colleague and a doctor and a woman that I trust implicitly with my own health, um, and I want to share her with you. So let me do a quick introduction of Dr. Angela DeRosa. Dr. Angela DeRosa is a dynamic professional on a mission to change the face of women's health and wellness. As a respected, internationally recognized authority on women's hormonal health, Dr. DeRosa understands the range of health issues women face leading up to and during menopause, as she was in full-blown menopause by the age of 35. Dr. DeRosa has more than 25 years of experience in the medical field, both on the pharmaceutical side and in clinical practice. Here's where it gets really good. Dr. DeRosa's enthusiasm for educating educating patients on the realities of menopause and the risk factors of hormonal health imbalances has never waned. It was the driving force <clears throat> excuse me, behind her first best-selling book, How Your Doctor is Slowly Killing You, A Woman's Health Survival Guide. Her book, along with its controversial title, caught the attention of lots of public media and the medical community. And she received an avalanche of requests from physicians across the country wanting to learn more. So the reason I tell you this part of her bio, of which she has a very long bio, folks, like she's legit, <laughs> um, is that she is the one that is training our doctors on hormonal health because they didn't really get trained like we would like for them to. So we're going to dive into that and so many other things. Um, she really is the per, the expert when it comes to women's hormonal health and especially related to bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. So welcome, Dr. Angela DeRosa. Thank you, Sharon, for that lovely introduction. And I love being known as the guru and trying to be doctors into submission to do that. <laughs> yes, we need you in that role. She was just telling me off air that um, how she is trying to retire, but people don't really want her to retire. And I'm one of those people. I'm like, no, we need you. <laughs> oh, There's too much work to do still. So. Too much to yeah. do. All right. Well, I would love it if you would share some of your story, because I feel like that mm -hmm. um starts to break open the conversation about menopause and perimenopause. It doesn't just look one way, does Absolutely. it? And, um, and I appreciate the opportunity to tell my story because I think it, it, it can be compelling. And it really leads to the real common knowledge that it doesn't matter any age, at any age, any women can potentially go through perimenopause or menopause. And please, if you feel that something's wrong, don't accept the first answer you get. Keep seek seeking answers because we are our own best advocate. And you can still have regular periods. You could still um, be in your 30s and be in full-blown menopause, or not full-blown menopause, at least in full-blown perimenopause leading up to menopause. So don't accept the conventional thinking as true because unfortunately a lot of medicine is pro improperly trained. So and how I got to this whole point where I got heavily involved in this space, and it's actually my passion and driving purpose in life, is it really started with a professional and personal collision <laughs> in my 20s um, that was very mysterious to me at the time, but it's become oh so very clear in hindsight. In my 20s and uh, early 30s, I started having a whole host of symptoms. And mind you, I was in medical school and residency at the time. And I was having hot flashes, night sweats. I was becoming incredibly anxious and having panic attacks. And, and I'm a normally very upbeat, happy person. I was gaining weight and, um, despite never eating because I was running around like a madman in my residency in medical school. Um, I was also not sleeping well. And I just wasn't feeling like myself. I was incredibly tired. But everyone kept saying, well, you're a medical student. You're in residency. You should be tired. You're under a lot of stress. But what became most alarming to me was that I was starting to have significant heart palpitations, but also passing out when I was working out. And I went to see cardiologists, endocrinologists, all of the potential you potentially could see, 
and nobody could give me really straight answers. And even the cardiologist came up with this really kind of obscure terminology that you have hypersympathetic symptom, meaning that you're on overdrive, your body just doesn't know how to shut down your sympathetic system, and that's why you're passing out. Well, I was put on beta blockers to slow, to slow my heart. I was put on anxiety medications, antidepressant medications, things to help me sleep. And by the time I was 30, I was on, on five different medications. And it wasn't until I turned 35 and some learning from that period in between that I went through full-blown menopause. And it was clear to me at that point that everything that I was experiencing in my late 20s was perimenopause. I was having the hot flashes, night sweats, because I was becoming estrogen deficient, the fatigue, the weight gain, the moodiness from the testosterone deficiency that was occurring. And even that alarming cardiac symptoms, what was happening as I was going into runs of arrhythmias that was causing me to pass out when my heart rate became elevated. And that was due to estrogen deficiency. Women get heart palpitations all the time or arrhythmias in their heart because it destabilizes the muscle in the heart. And we often get million dollar workups, but it's not recognized as a hormone deficiency symptom. Mm -hmm. So it was really alarming to me at the time that I went back and thought about how I was treated, how I was misdiagnosed. I was completely snowed on all these medications that I didn't need. And if someone would have just put me on hormones at the time, my life would have been so much better that seven year time period that I had to lose in my life. And what, for after I got done being perplexed, then I got really angry. <laughs> yeah. Like, and I want to learn everything that I can about all of this because it is my job and mission now to make sure that not one, one woman in my care or in direct influence will be treated that way because these symptoms are so impactful to us, but also they're not just about symptoms. These deficiencies lead to major chronic illness and we need to address it. And the conventional side of medicine is doing very little about it. <laughs> And didn't it also impact your marriage? Oh, yeah. I ended up going through a divorce at the time. And I think back because also my libido is in the crapper and I didn't want to have sex with my new husband. But I just wasn't, I was a shell of myself. Yeah. I didn't, and I didn't understand what was happening to me. And sometimes when women lose the libido and the desire for sexual intimacy, they also start to ask this question, and I'm sure you hear this over and over again, or their state is, well, I love my husband, but I'm not in love with him. I don't want to have sex with him. So the second they feel that lack of libido or desire toward their partner, you start to think, well, is there something wrong with the relationship or do I not yeah. love them? And, and I started going down that rabbit hole and I'm thinking, what's wrong with my relationship? And, and also when you're depressed and anxious and having panic attacks on top of it, and my poor young husband was also a physician. He didn't understand what was going on and didn't know how to help me. And it just created a lot of conflict in our relationship that didn't need to be there. Um, it doesn't need to be. We are both here. We're both physicians. <laughs> They're trying to figure this all out. Trying to figure yeah. it out. Yeah. And I was starting to feel like I was going crazy when people were labeling me. Mm. Oh, my gosh. Mm. Well, I want you to know, just through knowing you and having these kinds of conversations, there's someone in my orbit who um, she was saying, I feel like I'm in, I'm going into menopause, but everyone, all the doctors tell me that can't possibly be because I'm only in my thirties. And I said, you keep going, you, you, you keep going because you know, your body better than anybody else does. And if there's something wrong, you know, what's going on. And she finally found someone who was able to say, yeah, actually you are in perimenopause. And yeah. it's not as unusual as you think it is. <laughs> no, and what's so interesting in the last 25 years of doing this, I've noticed, and everyone still quotes this number, that the average age of menopause is 50 to 52. Well, I'm going to tell you that is no longer truthful mm -hmm. because I am seeing the average now, and I've seen tens of thousands of patients over the years, it's probably closer to 46, 47, that wow. women are starting to really... go through menopause much sooner and around and it's the time leading up and around to menopause and menopause is just elvis has left the building the ovaries have shut down it is done and over mother nature doesn't want us to have babies anymore but unfortunately they on an indirect consequence of that is we no longer produce hormones but the ovary doesn't typically shut down overnight unless we yank it out or something but mm -hmm. typically it just does a slow steady decline over 10 to 15 years in advance of that so if you're genetically programmed say to have menopause at 45, you're going to likely start to exhibit symptoms in your early 20s. 
I was programmed at 35, which meant I was starting to have symptoms in my 20s. So it's it's important to understand that it doesn't happen overnight and it's usually a 10 to 15 year process. And you can be having regular periods all the way up until about a year or two before menopause. And you could still be having significant hormonal imbalances, but if nobody knows what to look for, they're going to misdiagnose you. Yeah. And one of those misdiagnoses, isn't it often they'll say, oh, you're just depressed or you're anxious. And we start treating the symptoms like that. Oh, yeah. So it's interesting to me and the tremendous gender bias that goes on, because if we look at, let's focus on testosterone here for a second, because it's okay. a great example of this, this dynamic that most patients and most clinicians don't realize that testosterone is women's most abundant hormone. We make on a day-to-day -day basis more testosterone than we do estradiol, but we get, it's not even addressed primarily in women, but it does the exact same things for us as it does for men. It helps with executive function, thinking, cognition. It helps with mood, memory. So it is mother nature serotonin. It helps with muscle endurance, ability to gain muscle mass and work out effectively with endurance and not feel like you got hit by a buzz afterwards. It is our prime driver of libido and desire. And it's most one of its most important roles is it helps with glucose metabolism. So when we lose our testosterone, we start to gain weight in the midsection and we become insulin resistant and diabetic and have a heart attack and stroke. So it starts this whole pathway. But a man who walks into the office of a physician and presents with those exact symptoms and, and or they have erectile dysfunction. Erectile dysfunction in men is very obvious. For women, it's we just don't have clitoral sensitivity or orgasms are weaker or we have no desire. Mm -hmm. But if a man presents to a physician, they're going to check their testosterone levels. They're likely going to get an erectile dysfunction drug and their testosterone. A woman presents the exact same way. They're going to get thrown on an antidepressant and sleep medication. Yes. And so it's really, it's, it's maddening to me that we cannot put that together. It's so simple. Why didn't those hormones present exactly the same? It does the same stuff for us. So I want to ask you, you may not remember this because we haven't spoken in a little while, but you told me a story that stuck out in my brain. And it was a story of you were speaking from a stage to a group of hundreds of physicians. And you said, if someone came in with these symptoms and they were a man, how many of you would test their mm -hmm. hormone levels? And then you asked them the same thing for women. Do you remember this story? Oh, yeah. Can you tell it? Oh, yeah. It was just a, a marvel to me. I, I present like a, a, I present an a and, and, what did I say? A sexually neutral case to a patient. Mm. I said, okay, these are the symptoms that they're presenting with. I don't talk about menstrual status or anything. I just say, okay, these are the symptoms they're presenting with. And let's assume second, this is a male patient. How many of you would treat them and what would you treat them for? And I kind of asked people around the audience and almost everybody inevitably said they were going to check their testosterone levels and that ultimately they were all going to treat them with testosterone. With the, When I said, okay, let's, what if this is a woman? And they're like, oh, well, let me give them any preps. Like not one of them were going to check testosterone levels in women that they were going to put them on antidepressants and really work them up for full-blown mood disorders likely. Very few, maybe a couple of hands went up to even think that that was even a possibility. Wow. But, but what's so maddening to me is that it's, and what's so um, problematic is men typically start to show testosterone deficiency symptoms in their 40s and 50s. It gets really marked in their 60s. Women start to show testosterone deficiencies in their 30s. And then if they come in with a hot flash, they are already testosterone deficient because we lose testosterone first. So yes. all these women walk around with hot flashes and nights that are already deficient of 95% of their testosterone production, which is coming from their ovary. The other five comes from the adrenal. But they're, we're walking, a whole bunch of us are walking around with testosterone deficiencies and completely ignored and they get labeled as depressed or even worse, fibromyalgia. Because testosterone deficiency leads to muscle pain and lack of energy. So could you imagine you're depressed, you're, you are gaining weight, you're, you just have this mood disorder, and then you say, oh, my muscles hurt. I'm and you're not it. sleeping. And you're not sleeping. Oh, ding, 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 fibromyalgia. But 98% of fibromyalgia is, is either testosterone deficiency, low-functioning thyroid or subclinical thyroid, or vitamin D deficiency, or a combination of the three. But are labeled and then these women get these labels that then they're considered when, when a patient walks into a physician office with saying you have a history of fibromyalgia most doctors roll their eyes and go oh my god this is going to be a difficult patient and they're crazy so you don't want that label we get labeled with it all the time 
Really? You put these women on testosterone, and ninety-eight percent of them are going to get better, or thyroid, or vitamin B, or both. That is so funny to me. I mean, it's not funny. It's just, it's amazing. I think about these women me. that are losing their lives. They've been put on opioids or antidepressants or right. and they're completely snowed under. And because people can't wake up to the fact that women actually make testosterone and it's in Okay. So let's just, since we're there and we're talking about the medical community and and even the role that you play inside of that to help them. So why don't our doctors know about this why why are we now educating the patient so that they can get the care that they need well i think it's multi-fold so number one lack of education i mean when the women's health initiative came out in 20 2002 it really demolished uh, education and hormonal health for women completely because not only everyone was worried about the hormones causing breast cancer and all that stuff and then it just at that point, they stopped training about it because it was they didn't want to train people to treat with estrogen because they thought it was dangerous. But the problem was, and it actually goes way, way, way back when they were assigning names to sex hormones. And they thought, okay, estrogen is women, so we're going to be that women really are estrogen dominant, and we're going to go estradiol, it's the female hormone. Testosterone is the male hormone. But what's really problematic is men make estradiol and women make testosterone right. but we've been put in these buckets since the 30s and it really hasn't largely evolved so there's an extremely deficient amount of education we don't get trained in um, medical school we don't get trained in residency if you want to learn about it you have to find resources to do this and it's really really problematic but what is also problematic and probably even a bigger driver is think of all the money that's being made by pharmaceutical companies to have us on drugs. Think about if if I were to put a woman on, say, estradiol and testosterone, which is very inexpensive by comparison, they may not need sleep medications. They may not need yeah. cholesterol drugs. They may need, need antidepressants. They may not need drugs to treat hot flushes. They may not need a whole host of medications that are adding up to billions of dollars in big pharma and think of all the chronic illness that also comes from that, the high blood pressure, the cholesterol, the diabetes. Yeah. This is a big industry that makes a shit ton of money, pardon my language, off the backs of people and their health. And, yeah. and unfortunately, there's also a significant amount of gender bias. A lot of these folks running these companies in Congress and people who make these societal guidelines, they discount women. And we're supposed to stoically go into the merry night. Yeah. We're no longer useful after we can't have babies anymore, but God forbid a man and his penis are having problems. You know? God forbid he can't get an erection. Then, exactly. <laughs> then we spend hundreds of millions of dollars oh, on that. You, the, the Department of Defense spends billions of dollars for their, um, their soldiers and things for erectile dysfunction drugs. Right. And it was even more crazy to me, is, and I and I... I treat transgender patients and I'm very supportive of people and their choices mm -hmm. uh, in the right scenarios. But a lot of insurance companies cover those kind of hormonal therapies for that patient population, but we can't even get estradiol or the basic hormones even for menopause treatment covered by a lot of insurance companies are outrageously expensive. And they right. don't cover testosterone for us at all because we have zero testosterone products available in the commercial space for women. We have to get it compounded. So there's a lot of gender bias going on and a lot of big pharma influence in the back. But if a man wanted Viagra, would that be covered by insurance? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, Come my on. <laughs> I mean, I kind of knew the answer, but I was like, let me just ask. Maybe, no. maybe there's an ounce of sanity out there. But I mean, I just, I look at that and go, that's how committed we are culturally to men having an active sex life that they can enjoy into their old age, but where- But who are they to have sex with? I think they want right. to enjoy it. But here's the interesting thing. I think right now, this is probably the first, it has to be the first time in history that anyone is even starting to have conversations about women and them enjoying and having a sex life that feels good for them. Like no one has talked, like, I think about this with my mom's generation and I'm like, mm -hmm. she may have gone to her grave without ever really enjoying sex. Like, yeah, I think that yeah. that's a very real possibility. And I, we've, you know, my mom and I, my mom came from a very long line of Catholics. So we didn't talk about such things, oh, God okay. forbid. Mm -hmm. um, but 
I feel like that that very, it's very possible that that was the case for her. I've treated lots of elderly patients over the years. And, and then a lot of couples would often come in and the dynamic is so interesting to me. Well, a lot of those women with the hormones, that they either drank a lot or the little old ladies in their Xanax is how they honestly coped through a lot mm-hmm. of stuff because they stoically went through it. But from a sexuality standpoint, it's amazing to me that it was all about the male focus in previous generations. And it is getting better. But I definitely agree it is. That. But there's still a heavy focus on the men's satisfaction versus a female satisfaction and also an inability of education to talk to people about what really truly pleases women. Mm-hmm. And there's still a lot of falsification that is penetration and not clitoral stimulation for a lot of women. And there's just as we could go on and on. But uh, an interesting story is I had this older couple who shall not be named. <laughs> they came into my practice. And this this gentleman, they must have been in their 80s, and he was just a little horn dog. <laughs> in my language, I love it. And they kept telling his wife that he needed to have either a wound dog or masturbation or penetration at least three to four times a, a week, otherwise he was going to get prostate cancer. And this is what he was telling his wife, and she believed him. And through this whole conversation, when I finally got her behind closed doors alone, she expressed and she had never had an orgasm in her entire relationship with this man. They've been married over 50 years. So I sent her home with a vibrator. And I said, here, go try this. And you, you should have, the appointment we had in the next one was just very, very fun. It was fun. Because she's like, oh my gosh, I never knew. And But the problem is it started to change the dynamic of the relationship. Mm-hmm. But I was like, you cannot tell her that this is going to prevent, prevent prostate cancer. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. Like, yes. It's just funny. Like this woman, she got into her 80 and never had an organ. So. Right. Right. So I'm glad that she found you at least. And she was able to experience that. (laughs) Even even if it even if it wasn't uh even if it wasn't her husband that got her there. It's all good. All right. So I wanna let's since we're talking about couples and the dynamic of how this shows up and all of that, like I just wanna I wanna get into the the symptoms. I I guess we can start with the symptoms. Um, to sort of guide the discussion that impacts the relationship. And I feel like the biggies there are sex drive, of course, um, or pain during sex, mood, anger issues, which you and I have talked about before and how that comes to be. Um, Yeah, and just like that decline in needing to be the nurturer or wanting to take care of everyone, that is a shift for women also around this time. So could you tell us a little bit about what you've seen and experienced there? Well, it's such an interesting dynamic between relationships and just even the natural hormone progression, because again, we're almost assumed that we're going to go quietly into the night and become very stoic, but having the ability to change that hormonal dynamic where we can give people their lives back and they have their sexual um, their sexuality. But what I find when women don't find hormone replacement is that they often do go stoic early in the night and they lose their voice in a relationship. Mm -hmm. But those who I start to replace hormones and get them back to their vital youthful self, they start to appreciate how good they feel. They know that they're not going silently into the night, Mm -hmm. but it can often create dynamics within a relationship that can either become very helpful because now they want more intimacy with the partners and then that has this positive cascade. Or it can also um, enable women to find their own voice and become empowered because now they feel better and they start to push back often in relationships. As they, as we get older, we start to develop our frontal lobe disorder. We start speaking our mind more freely. Yes. But that doesn't always go over so well. And mm-hmm. um, I think women, and you talk about this a lot, and I so appreciate that it's, as we get older, I think we become more about our own needs, whereas our first part of our lives are dealing with our children and caretaking the marriage we're the ones that are responsible for relationships at all of us our parents right. our children our, our friends our family and our and oftentimes the male gets to concentrate on work but then as they start to slow down and they start to calm down they want to more focus on home while we're like okay we did our time yes <laughs> we want to go explore and if i empower them through hormonal balance and they have more energy and they feel better they have mental clarity that can either go one or two ways they it's better or sometimes it doesn't it can get worse right i see it a lot where they um you know like a, a man because he's been working hard for call mm-hmm. it 40 years or so 
Um, and this is just the nature of our society and our culture and how we operate and all that. So it's not like um, men are doing this to us, but men, yeah. like when, when children come to, you know, come into play, women primarily will take on that front row parent of course. role. And men don't necessarily have to give up too much, but even a woman who's working, there's always a give up for women. And so then by the time they're going through or heading into menopause and the kids are grown and they're less or at least less dependent upon them, then there's time and space and maybe even some energy for them yeah. and what they want to pursue and all the things that they sort of put on hold. So in in their relationship, the man is sort of like ready to slow down a little bit where the woman is ready to speed up. A little bit. Yeah, exactly. And sometimes that can be a bit of a mismatch. But I have found that when people understand what's really going on, then you don't have to be carbon copies of each other, but you do have to be respectful of those differences in order That's to right. continue to be in relationship in healthy relationship with one another. And also too, that when I even I think about hormone balance for men, is they lose their testosterone, there tends to be a calming effect of men. Mm-hmm. But it gets to a, a certain point where then they drop off the cliff and they get all the symptoms that are problematic for men. And in particular, they don't like the erectile dysfunction. But if they, they, they don't have the energy fatigue, but there's almost like this sweet spot where they've declined enough where yeah. they're kind of more mellow. But then if they go too far, they feel like crap and then they don't do well either. Mm-hmm. So it's a fine balance. But but with hormone replacement, a lot of these guys, they have their testosterone levels back optimized as they have their 20s and 30s. And they don't mellow out at all. I mean, they're still primed. And yeah. That can also be problematic in a relationship. Too. What would you, what would you say about, because I'm seeing this more and more and I don't, I have some suspicions of what to make of it, but obviously I'm not coming at it from a medical perspective. So I'd love your take on it where men are, I'm going to say in their forties and they're mm-hmm. just, they're not interested in sex anymore. Now, um, they, and they tell their wives that, that they're, that they're, and they, they might admit to some erectile dysfunction, but they might just say, it's not important to me, or they might have some excuses. Um, but that to me feels like, okay, there's something deeper here to look at and not just write it off. And sometimes like, like I recently had a client tell me, You know, my husband and I had this, we hadn't had sex in more than a year. And Mm -hmm. I finally had a very difficult conversation with him. He went to the doctor, he got the pills, right? Because we're solving that one issue (laughs) as opposed to looking at his testosterone levels. But, and then she said, nothing really changed. And so a few months later, she started counting his pills and she's like, he's not even taking. Mm -hmm. So what do you make of that? A man who's just, not I'm interested sure in solving it. Not really interested in their forties. So I wonder if there's someone on the side. I mean, mm-hmm. that would be my first uh, thought, just because mm-hmm. men typically have really good libidos um, for a long period of time. So hormonally, it takes a lot for them to lose their libido and desire for sex, mm-hmm. um, which can lead to other things. Like right now, I'm seeing a lot of people use marijuana, and that causes a major imbalance where low testosterone, high estradiol, which can really lead to low libido and impotence. So that's become highly problematic. Um, there's a lot of endocrine disruptors. So hormones can definitely be a big play, not only testosterone deficiency, but also the imbalance where they get too much estradiol and that can lead to a whole bunch of problems. And that's usually due to midsection weight gain that overconverts mm-hmm. testosterone to estradiol. And they and we're also seeing a lot more body image issues with men. Some we're kind of catching up to women in a lot of ways. Mm. Um, so, so it's just been kind of interesting. So, but 40s is a little bit young. Usually they've done a lot of damage to their body, either with anabolic steroids or they, they've gotten overweight, they're on medications mm-hmm. or different things that would drive low libido or the estrogen excess can come in. But there are some medical things that could definitely lead to that. But oftentimes, just as in women, you got to ask, are there, are there psycho- psychological issues coming out? Are there performance concerns? Are there other things, work stress and things going on or other people that are influencing that too? You mentioned weight. Is there also, is there any impact from if someone is drinking a lot? Oh yeah, absolutely. Because 
And they always throw up the interesting terms that men often live, and we all get a little bit more in, in, uninhibited when we have a little bit of alcohol. But again, there's that point when it goes to the other yeah, side. Yeah, right. You can't perform as well as you do and you can have problems with that. But also drinking can lead to liver abnormalities, weight gain issues. Um, so it depends on the amount of alcohol that's being drank. It's right? mm -hmm. causing other problems. Because even too much alcohol um, can lead to the increase of midsection weight, which can lead to the low testosterone and high estrogen levels and various other things too. Cirrhosis of the liver. So you have to be cautious of those things. So how does someone, if if many of our doctors don't know or understand about this, how do you advise someone to get some help? I'm struggling in this area, but you're telling me my doctors don't really know. What do I do? Well, the key is to find good resources. And other women who maybe have gotten hormone replacement therapy, some friends are the best source of information. So if you can talk to those and have got good experience, that's always a wise idea. But when you're looking on the internet, let's say you're trying to scope out people in your area, look at their website, see what they are like using terms like functional medicine, integrative medicine, bioidentical hormone replacement specialist. Look for those key words versus your typical ob in your PCP. And not to say some of those folks aren't going to do that, but you want to make sure that they're using those buzz phrases so you've got to get a sense that they're focused on something that may be different than conventional thinking. Other ways of finding good that. folks, too, is um, there are certain organizations. So, for instance, I'm a medical director of the largest compounding pharmacy in the country called Belmar Pharma Solutions. And we do compounding and send them out to all of our different clinics and patients across the country. So even calling resources like that saying, hey, who do you know in my area that may do this? Or even some of your local compounding mm -hmm. pharmacists may know who some good folks are in the area that specialize in hormones. There are organizations um, like AMMG um, or the um, A4M, which are big societal folks, that they may have some resource data banks on different things. But I typically find just asking around, talking to compounding pharmacies that know these good people in the area can be very, very valuable as well. So I, I feel like we need to talk about the, the compounding, the bioidentical versus the... I feel like we need to have some conversation about that because there's a lot of people out there schlepping hormones, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so. And a lot of people doing a lot of damage because they're not properly educated. Right. Which is problematic. And, when it, and bioidentical hormone replacement therapy isn't that hard to understand, but a lot of people make it more complex than it needs to be. All it, all it really means is it mimicking. So I say, is it biomimetic? Meaning is it mimicking exactly what your ovary was making when it was making it at optimal levels. So for instance, 17 beta estradiol is the estrogen that is made from your ovary. That is what is naturally produced coming from your ovary every single day when you're functioning. Why would I go in and give somebody say a horse's urine or an ethylene estradiol that doesn't look exactly that? It's different in chemical structure. But there are, there are pharmaceutical drugs on the market, like 5 dot patch, S-Trace cream. They are bioidentical. They're made with 17-beta estradiol. Usually everything we compound, in the pellets, cream, shells, trophies, all those are 17-beta estradiol. We're going to use the exact hormone your ovary once made. So you, you need to figure out what that is. So making sure you ask, is this bioidentical? Meaning is it 17-beta estradiol? Is it pure testosterone? not a methylated testosterone, or is it progesterone? Is it not Provera, which is a medoxy progesterone acid? You just need regular progesterone, regular testosterone, and c beta estradiol. So essentially, in my dumb mind, without all the, yeah. the technical terms, <laughs> um, one is sort of, one is synthetic and from something that is not, that doesn't originate in the body. And the other is... Well, Keep in mind that you can synthesize something to be bioidentical. Synthesis, oh, okay. Word synthetic, it just to synthesize means it, it's a synthetic derivative, but you can synthesize something to be bioidentical. But because I've heard sure you say, is, I've heard you so, say like the horse urine thing before, and that makes my head want to explode. Like I'm yeah, hitting horse urine. That's what Primarin was. It's it's a molecule similar to 17 beta estradiol, but it's not even close to being that. So it's not bioidentical. But we can synthesize 17 beta estradiol in a lab or in a pharmaceutical company. Okay. So a lot of people use the word synthetic versus plant-based. 
I mean, all of the hormones largely come from Mexican yams or other certain plant bases. And the big pharmaceutical companies use the same active base ingredients as the compounding pharmacies do. And okay. they're both FDA approved, but where everyone gets all up in arms, oh, the compounds aren't um, FDA approved, they're dangerous. Well, no, let me first off say that the, the reputable compounding pharmacies are highly regulated, highly, um, they're under such scrutiny by the DEA, the FDA, they get the state's board of pharmacy inspecting them. So a lot of these companies, they can't fly under the radar. The rules and rights have changed. But I wanna make it clear, like, so for instance, Imagine that, so the big difference in compounding and let's say getting a product from the pharm big pharma company. So for instance, let's say I have a batch of progesterone powder and that gets sent to the big pharmaceutical companies. They are gonna go make and mass those different pills of progesterone every single day, the same exact dose. Mm -hmm. So it's like going to McDonald's and going and buying a pigment. They're made exactly the same every day. They're mass produced. There's no customization to it. Okay. But it's made from this powder and it gets sent to them. Well, those same powders that are FDA approved get sent to compounding pharmacists. But instead of mass producing the same exact pill over and over again, what they're doing is taking a little bit of it, maybe compounding it with a little estradiol, maybe a little testosterone, or they're adding a little B12, or they're tweaking it in a manner that is a little bit different than the mass produced product. So it's like going to a French restaurant <laughs> and they're using the same ingredients, but they're creating this fine meal for you versus the mass produced, everything's made the same. So know that the base ingredients are all FDA approved, but the ultimate thing on the compounding side, they don't investigate every single product that comes out, but it's all going in with the same approved ingredients. Mm -hmm. Whereas the big pharmaceutical companies are investigating that one mass produced product. So it's, it's more practical. Okay. So I want to ask you a question just because it's near and dear to my heart, but I didn't prep. I didn't say, I didn't tell you I was going to ask you this. So if you want to, well, if you want to punt, I, I, if you want to punt, you can't. But I know that there's been lots of studies done around, um, or not lots, there's been a few studies that have gotten some attention recently that would lead you to believe that hormone replacement therapy leads to Alzheimer's. And I don't believe that to be true. And I'm pretty sure you don't either. So are you able to speak to that a little bit? Yeah, nothing can be further from the truth. When you actually look at biodental hormone replacement therapy, not only estradiol, but even testosterone in particular, the data is very compelling that they actually should slow cognitive decline, that the risk of Alzheimer's goes up when they become deficient in those hormones. So it, it, they're very, very powerful instruments. And the way I look at these hormones when it comes to brain health, think of testosterone as the hunter. It is the one that's very specific. It works in our limbic systems and our executive function thinking. So it helps with our men memory, ability to retain information, um, recall that kind of killer instinct, but to think of estrogen as the communicator, it's the gatherer. So it's, it's helping all the different brain centers communicate with one another. And if you can keep those hormones active and normalize at physiologic healthy levels, it stands to reason that those, those hormones are only going to be helpful for brain center communication. And the data that I've seen is that they're actually very powerful tools in prevention of onset of Alzheimer's and dementias. The doctor that you referred me to here locally, my hormone doctor, she said, I asked her that and she said, they actually will prescribe hormone replacement therapy because it will, if, if they see Alzheimer's coming on because it helps with cognitive function. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. In particular, testosterone for that executive function. Right. So what do you think needs to happen or should happen? Or what do you see happening in the medical community that might make our medical community be more supportive of women's hormonal health? What do you think? What, what's needed? Well, it's going to take a major, major paradigm shift and also a a kind of shift in majority thinking of conventional doctors versus the integrative health functional medicine. Because there's a huge lion's share of clinicians that still think that what's going on on the hormonal side is either dangerous for patients and they say there's no data. The problem is they just haven't looked at the data. Right. So there needs to be a cultural shift within the medical community. And I'm starting to see it happen more and more because you're seeing more folks leave the conventional side and they get very frustrated because nobody's getting better. It doesn't pay very well, which is a really big driver. Nobody has time to spend with patients. So they're becoming either concierge doctors or cash-based physicians. 
who then can take that time and then they think, well, how can I gain revenue sources? So, oh, wow, I hear the hormones might be able to do that. So then the next thing you know, although their drivers may not necessarily be altruistic, they end up in the right place. Yeah. But it's also going to take getting big pharma out of the picture and trying to shut down a lot of compounding pharmacy and the understanding there, which I, I that's probably the biggest albatross of this whole thing. That's so the biggest really threat. driving the change. Yeah, it really is because they, they stand to lose a lot of money if they can't sell other drugs. But the biggest changing um, thing that I see is happening, though, are women are advocating more for themselves. And that's what's actually really driving the change because they're demanding yeah. better of medicine. And it's going to take the physicians and the nurse practitioners and PAs all, all a lot longer to make the shift. But it's women pushing them to make that change, which is what we really need. That's awesome. That's awesome. And it's very, very it's empowering, right? That, that if we, if we push it or we demand it, or we keep asking and asking until we get the good answers that that could start to effectuate change. Yeah. Well, and they're spending their dollars in the areas where they're getting answers. So, I mean, that's, that's right. Drives some of the change too. Yeah. I always say vote, (laughs) vote with your wallet. (laughs) All right. So Dr. DeRosa, where can people find out more about your work and get in touch with you if, if you want that or or get your book? Because I know your book is fantastic. Everyone, you should go get it right now. She's going to tell you where. <laughs> so, I mean, this place is really um, all, all, all things linked to drhotflesh.com. So there's a lot of consumer information. There's blogs, there's videos, there's a whole host of information links to get my book. And then there's also a tab at the top that for medical professionals. So if folks want to learn about my training institute, which is called the Hormonal Health Institute, we train clinicians all across the globe and predominantly here in the U.S., but we have a pretty good share of folks now outside of the U.S. So they can go there to obtain that information. But there's a whole host of information on drhotflash.com website. Drhotflash.com. That is so perfect. I will make sure that that is in our show notes. Dr. DeRosa, I know how busy of a person you are, and I appreciate you taking the time to just share your knowledge and wisdom with, with my community and always with me, of course. So thank you so, so much for being here. And mostly thank you for the work that you're doing in the world for women's health. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's, it's a passion, obviously, and a mission. It is. And you're good at I appreciate it. Them. And I'm really happy you're able to give um, me a voice and all the others that are doing this as well, because the work you're doing is really important and impactful. And there's so much synergy there. So I appreciate what you're doing as well. Yeah. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank you so much. If you're listening to this podcast because you're struggling to decide whether to stay or go in your marriage, and you're serious about finding that answer, it's time to book a truth and clarity session with a member of my team. On the call, we'll discuss where you are in your marriage and explore if there's a fit for you and I to work together so you can make and execute the right decision for you and your marriage. Go to clarityformymarriage.com to fill out an application now. That's clarityformymarriage.com.